The Vision to the Black Heaven, Chapter 22 Hans drove the Escalade through the town, past streets of neatly kept homes and manicured lawns, past an old dilapidated building, a gas station closed years ago, past the city park where the playground equipment was rusted and falling apart, past the grade school where the children were playing in the were playing during recess. Hans decided that this town was not as neat or well-kept as the town that he lived in. Passing the church, Hans snarled, remembering the words of his grandfather. People are so easily manipulated. Religion is nothing more than a means of social control. Religion is the opiate of the people. Following the, the highway further into town, he drove under giant limbs growing over the road, giving the road a look of a covered bridge. The trees were budding, ready to sprout leaves for the spring season. What seemed out of place was the absence of fresh spring air, the, the silence of nature's noises, birds singing, chirping, welcoming the spring season. The air seemed sour, stagnant, almost stale. The Escalade rounded a curve. The pavement ended into a gravel road that became a long, sloping dirt path. An old two-story house appeared on the right over a hill and built in front of a small ridge. It was a house different from other houses in this small town. The porch was fallen apart. The roof patched with different colored shingles. The house needed painting. Pickup trucks were parked in the front lawn not allowing the spring grass to grow. The house seemed to be absent of life, a void of vegetation, empty of spirit. Voltarian looked at Hans and said, Turn in here. This is our destination. Mixed emotions filled Hans as he turned into the makeshift driveway. He felt his eyebrows rise. Something was different with this lone house. The light seemed to be softer. The shadows were deeper, thicker, richer. Could shadows be deeper, richer, Hans thought to himself? In a strange way, this house reminded him of his home in Italy. The Escalade came to a stop. Without thinking, Hans put the Cadillac in park, shut the motor off. Opening the door, he got out and stood on the carpet of dirt, and pine needles from three half-dead pine trees in the front yard. The edge of the yard had a fence with dry-looking vines of poison ivy. The vines were budding, ready to sprout oily leaves of irritation for the new season. After the long drive, Hans stood, stretched, inhaled deeply, expecting to enjoy the fresh aroma of the natural fragrances of spring in the wilderness. Instead, filling his nostrils was a scent he recognized, the stench of rotting, moist vegetation, a stench that occurred every time the shadows appeared. Voltarian got out of the car, stood next to Hans. Both watched as two men, dressed in matching bib overalls, dirty white t-shirts, and wore out unlaced work boots, walked out of the house and stood on the front porch to meet them. Hans and Victorian looked at each other in quiet disbelief. Both groups of men hesitated, experiencing an instant recognition which communicated a kinship between strangers who had somehow knew that this day would come. Hans lowered his sunglasses and saw the taller of the two men with almost white hair, low forehead, wide square jowls, a thick neck, round muscular shoulders, piercing black eyes, and a mouth with a snarled smile filled with double rows of teeth. Both men stood watching each other in a moment of silent acceptance and recognition. Voltarian saw the other man, older, smaller. In many ways, the older man reminded him of his grandfather with dark, thick, wizened skin, skin from a hard life as an outdoorsman. His black eyes sparkled with intelligence or evil. 
or both. A long moment passed. Old Lady Schroeder knew that silence and strange men was never a good combination. She went out to the porch to see what was going on. Instantly, she saw the resemblance. They shared recognition, the commonality between them. Hurrying out of the house, she lightheartedly said, Well, Pa, just don't stand there. Invite our guests in. Does anybody want fresh tea? I just made it this morning. Hans started walking toward the house, speaking in a slow, distinct, professional manner. I am Hans Schroeder III, and this is my friend, Valtarian Kotek. Old man Schroeder said, I is Schroeder. This is my oldest, Wutter. The men walked through the open screen door into a modest-looking home. Hans and Valtarian looked around inside the house. At the far wall of the living room was a large, dark, wood-stained, antique Victorian china hutch. The hutch had three large, ornate wood glass doors, glass mirrors behind the doors, and a large mirror on top of the cabinet that almost filled the wall. The large living room had drapeless windows, which almost filled the exterior walls, two windows on each wall and on either side of the front door. Hans and Baltarian sat down on an old, wore-out sofa upholstered with faded pastel flowers. Old man Schroeder and Woodard sat down on the adjacent sofa. A coffee table with inlaid mirrors was positioned before the two sofas. The overhead ceiling fan whirled on high as its blade coated with thick layers of dust accumulated from years of neglect. Above the ceiling fan were squares of mirrors covering the ceiling. The air was filled with a stench of dust, stale chewing tobacco, sweat, and the aroma of chicken dinner with onions and garlic hung heavy in the air. Voltarian sat looking at the living room. The dirty windows, the mirrors on the ceiling and coffee table reminded him of an article he read in a paranormal magazine about a device called the Devil's Cube. A cube where mirrors were assembled facing inside to reflect the light upon the mirrors a configuration allowing the light to reflect and the mirrors into infinity. The reflecting light was said to open different dimensions where noises of screaming and moaning had been recorded. He thought that this was a strange way to decorate a living room and wondered what the reasoning was behind it. Hans heard old lady Schroeder preparing iced tea. She dropped two ice cubes in each glass and then heard the tea being poured. The four men watched her walk from the kitchen into the living room, carrying the tray of refreshments across the tattered, wore-out, sculptured olive green carpet. She felt the men watching her as she served the glasses. She knew there was a time for a woman to be present, and when to be out of sight, and let the men talk. She served the glasses, then went back into the kitchen. Valtarian had carried a metal container into the house. When everyone got comfortable, he silently opened the cylinder. The ancient scroll slid out, carefully untying the package, unrolling the scroll to a specific spot, which Hans had already seen. Everybody watched as the picture of the medallion came into view. He waited a long moment to talk, letting everyone get a look at the picture. Without explaining the origins of the scroll, he gave a brief description of the medallion. Then Valtarian pointed to some of the differences on the facial features. Look at the distance between the eyes and the pictures of the two men. The elongated or oblate facial features. One almost looks like Native American. The other looks like European. He was careful to point out the differences in the unique landscape between the faces. Unknown trees and foliage signifying differences in climate. He was careful to point out the differences in the unique landscape between he was careful to point out the differences in the unique landscape behind the faces unknown trees and foliage signifying differences in climate one male was dressed as a warrior in armor and carried a spear while the other had no armor and did not carry a weapon 
and seemed to be wearing a simple burlap-style cloth. He pointed to the fine line of writing, a strange form of cuneiform calligraphy separating the two facial images. Valterian spoke softly, thoughtfully. I have spent many years studying languages from all over the world and from different periods of history. I have never found any writing or linguistic design remotely close to this language. Valterian sat back to watch everyone's reaction. Old Man Schroeder and Woodard looked at each other. Pa, Woodard said, this one looks like me, and the other one looks like that other guy we saw in town. What's going on, Pa? Old Man Schroeder whispered in a tone of determination. Don't know. But whatever it is, it's got something to do with that mountain, the crazy old mountain man and his grandson. Valterian started speaking again. Mr. Schroeder, do you live in a very unique area? I have done a lot of research in southern Indiana. Just over the mountain by Shoals, Indiana, is one of the world's largest gypsum mines. Then down by Salem, Indiana, by the White River. It's one of the largest areas of geodes in America. I stumbled across this by accident while researching the paths of ancient Native American civilizations called the Mound People. Just west of here in St. Louis is Cahokia, one of the largest ancient Indian sites in America. The civilization was once larger than London is today. I found this strange anomaly. We do not know much about the civilization, except that we assume that they migrated to this area from what is now Central America. They were an advanced civilization, not advanced in mechanical skills as we know today. <clears throat> they, were, they were an advanced civilization, not advanced in mechanical skills as we know today but advanced in that they performed mechanical feats of construction and transportation that we would have a challenge duplicating today. Outside of Chillicothe, Ohio, are the mysterious serpent mounds formed in the image of a snake eating an egg. These two areas are puzzling due to their locations being on or about the 37th parallel. Another area of Indian mounds is the Anderson, Indiana. I have done research on Native Americans and have made some interesting observations. In most of the literature I have read, there are facts that overlap with many other cultures. Allow me to explain. I have done research on Native Americans and have made some interesting observations. In most of the literature I have read, there are facts that overlap with many other cultures. Allow me to explain. In the Native American culture, totem poles are an important part of their Native American belief system. They're called the poles of wisdom and strength. Each pole is carved with images of their deities. The same concept is in the Masonic Rites. Two pillars of belief are liberty and equality. We can find evidence of this everywhere we look in America, from the White House in Washington, D.C., to the currency the Americans use as their money. These beliefs can be traced back to the Phoenicians in Sumeria literature and in ancient books of the Bible. What I find most interesting is that in most every story, myth, or legend about every civilization is their reference to an ancient precious gem. I believe that one of the reasons the Indians migrated from place to place was that they were in search of a specific gem their ancestors had told them about. In some ways, I had to wonder if the American Indians were not distant relatives to the Atlanteans who were in search of the crystals to rebuild their city. This area of Indiana has many naturally occurring geodes. I have done research. And there are three areas in America where these specific geodes are plentiful. Westernmost point of your country is Dugaway, Utah. Then there's a small area in Iowa. Then there's this area in southern Indiana. 
What makes this even more interesting is that all of these areas are either on or close to the 37th parallel. However, what makes this even more intriguing is that Mr. Schroeder III and I live on the 37th parallel also. What caught my attention was that Gobeleki Tepe, the Karahan, are two ancient civilizations estimated to be 9,500 and 12,000 years old are also on the 37th parallel. And according to ancient manuscripts, faceless men built these structures before the Neolithic age. Further research has shown that Beijing, China, Seoul, South Korea, Libsyn, Portugal, Washington, D.C. are all located on or very close to the 37th parallel. There seems to be something significant about the 37th parallel. He stopped talking and looked at the group. Woodard looked at Voltarian. What difference does that make? Voltarian smiled and said, This information raises some interesting questions about many different issues. But for the moment, we are only looking at one. What we are looking for is a natural crystal that is a key. A key to the energy that separates the dimensions. Or to make it easier to understand, what we're looking for is a key that opens spaces between spaces. What we're looking for is a crystal that can change the frequency of energy from one to another without destroying that energy. I believe that it is the change of energy that is the key to opening the spaces between spaces. There are legends that suggest crystals are used to transport energy, dematerialization and teleportation, telekinesis and improving a person's thinking. And still there are those that believe crystals can collect the Earth's electromagnetic energy and transport it to a different location, or to have it used in a special way in the past. Voltarian saw he was losing his audience. He stopped the technological talk. Simply stating, we're looking for a special gem. He opened a book and pointed to a picture of a stone in a ring. We're looking for a stone or group of stones that looks similar to this. He pointed to the picture of Solomon's ring. The stone looks like it is one stone with nine different stones surrounding it pieced together, making it look like one larger stone. Voltarian's words drifted off into a noiseless distance. Their host came out with a ceramic jug to refresh their drinks. Hans watched as his host expertly used her left hand and balanced a ceramic moonshine jug on the outside of her forearm. A clear liquid poured out, filling his glass, smiling knowing the scent of the white lightning. The aroma reminded him of the annual clandestine Gold Dawn meetings always held on December 21st, the winter equinox. Hans's mind drifted to a distant memory. His grandfather forced him to attend the meetings since he was a boy. He remembered the smell of the outer lobby with the ancient-looking furniture, Pictures of past grand masters and prominent members. His great grandfather's picture, H.R. Schroeder, was on the far wall as a significant member. Grandpa Schroeder would walk me into the musty main auditorium, explaining the meaning of the sacred symbols. Hans had fond memories of the Temple of the Golden Dawn. One day soon, he would bring his son into the fold and train him in the same manner. Voltarian continued talking, but Hans was still in his childhood memory. Smiling, he remembered himself and his friends at the meeting of the Golden Dawn Initiation Day, the ritual of burning their cares doll. They wrote their cares, fears, concerns on an object, usually an animated doll, then threw the doll of their concerns into the fire, eliminating concerns, risks, and consequences of life's responsibilities. The amateurs drank, partied, had a few illicit affairs, and called it secret. They are dilettantes, simply here for amusement, 
The real decision makers are in his family's club. The Grand Master of the group always opened the meetings with a special speech of historical significance relating to mystical clandestine writings. Then after the meeting's conclusion, the party is commenced into the meeting of the real business, where the real leaders got started. The top leaders of the organization entered private booths. A private booth with a one-way mirror for each individual. The occupant can see out, yet no one can see in. No one knows who's beside them. Everyone is secret to everyone else. In the ceremony meeting of the Golden Dawn, everyone wears a long robe fully covering their face, hands. The robe hangs to the floor, hiding one's body and shoes. Part of the initiation into the sect was a method of walking, so everyone seemed synonymous and indistinguishable from others. Everyone seems identical to each other, ensuring total privacy, creating a true secret society. The familiar voice of Ra begins slowly, softly speaking in a solid tone, bringing a specific and different meaning and message to each person. You are the chosen ones. Ra's voice resonated through the building. His voice clear and audible, yet his image hidden from view. Only the core leaders have ever seen Ra. No one dares repeat what they have seen due to Ra's retribution of unworthiness. The voice reviews the importance of the meeting to the core group. A diatribe of the meeting of number eight. Eight different epochs of time. Transformation from one time period to another. Our strength, influence, power, and opportunity is at its peak. We must conclude the past, capture the present, to conquer the future. We must find the keys. Ra's voice increased to a controlled whisper of intensity. Each person hears a message. A meaning, a motive, a task, a plan, a mission. There's always a cost as well as a result. The voice boomed with conviction. Sometimes the cost is small and sometimes the result is large. Other times the cost is large and the result seemingly small. Always the task and result are part of a greater picture. Yet every time the result is for the betterment of the golden dawn. In past meetings, he received instructions to buy specific stocks from American or Chinese electronic energy computer industries. He was told what political parties and members to support, what parties and members to ignore. The results of the instructions had made him a man of wealth, power, and influence beyond anyone's imagination. The amphitheater was a cavernous room of massive expansive built under the ancient stone mansion of the Golden Dawn. Eight identical, luxurious rooms built in a circle. Hans looked around the cavernous room. He saw the opposing mirrors, walls representing the other rooms surrounding the Colosseum-type environment. The center stage, an elevated platform with eight Separate, high-powered LED lights focused on the speaker's rostrum. Hans had been to numerous core group meetings. Each event, he wondered why the speaker only spoke to him directly, ignoring everyone else. The speaker only spoke in Italian, German, and English. After the meeting, he returned to the entrance of his assigned changing room, a changing room with a single-car garage. He could change, enter his car without revealing his identity, keeping the secrecy of his presence assured, feeling excited, rejuvenated, powerful. His host handed him the mason court jar. Hans nodded a silent thank you, took a sip, felt the calming sensation of the liquid soothe his carnal thirst. Hans' mind went back to his office to his grandfather's diary. He was missing something, something obvious, something simple, something important, 
something in plain sight. His grandfather's prized belongings, things he had promised he would never sell, was a woman's antique Elgin pendant watch. He had looked at the watch many times, so many times he could see it in his mind's eye. The five-petal gold iris with the nine-pointed star in the center of the iris. And inside the star was a diamond, or what looked like a diamond, in the center of the bloom. The two-foot gold chain with the solid gold choker and two inlaid opals were of a special interest also. The reverse side of the watch was a shield surrounding the name Alice. He wondered what the significance of July 4th, 1893 was. Grandfather had always known that the medallions were special, and when he bought them, that his luck had changed, but never knew why. Many times he would sit with his grandfather and just watch the sunset. Once a young man, he asked his grandfather, What are we doing? Grandpa replied, Looking into the distance of nothingness, listening to the natural music of the light and the echoes of the darkness. Hans felt an uncomfortable silence of everyone looking at him. He snapped out of his memories, took a sip from his mason jar, and continued his reflection upon what he could be missing. She smiled. She knew what they were looking for. They were looking for the crazy old mountain man's cabin. She felt herself smile and frown at the same time. She missed that crazy old mountain man. She knew that his mountain cabin was where the keys were. Years ago, she had talked to many Native American women who had told her about the legends of the magic rock, what it looked like, what it did, but they would never tell her where it was or where it was to be found. When the women heard that she had given birth to a boy with six fingers and toes, they refused to talk to her. They said she was a mother of a sky person, and the very people their ancestors escaped from many generations ago. Follow me, the old man got up, started walking outside. Show you some things interest you. Where are we going, Hans whispered. We going hate hunting, mumbled the old man. What is hate hunting? Hans questioned. Old Lady Shorter said, hate is the southern term for ghosts or unexplained things in the woods. Hans gave the old lady a questionable look as they walked out the door. They talked while walking up over a hill. Hans noticed a shadow in the corner of his vision. The more shadows appeared, the closer attention Hans paid to their movement. They stopped, looking at the ground. Hans picked up a rock. The shadows danced. Holding the dirty rock, he felt a strange power coming from the geode. Something from the geode tingled in his fingertips and in their hair and in their head. Hans looked at Schroeder and said, What is this? The wizened old man replied, They call them animal head rocks, pesky and hard, so hard and difficult to break open. They're just junk rocks, good for nothing. Old Lady Schroeder and the boys were wondering where their husband and their visitor Hans was. They walked outside. Behind the house went through the scrubby trees over the hill to see the two men walking and talking as if in a trance, lifting junk rocks, brushing the dirt off them, putting the rocks on the ground. Valterian walked up to the crowd, watching the two men aimlessly walking. Hans watched one shadow point to the geode and then point to the ground. He knew what the shadow wanted. He walked over to the spot, put the geode where the shadow demanded. Old Man Schroeder saw the shadows also. Then his shadow pointed to a different colored round rock. The old man lifted the rock, looked at it. The shadow again pointed to another spot on the ground. Old Man Schroeder dropped it, with what the shadow instructed. Walked to the other rock. The shadow pointed to a rock. Then to a spot on the ground. Old Man Schroeder obeyed walked, overlooking at the shadow, sensing a feeling of satisfaction, lifting the rock, putting it where the shadow demanded. 
This process went on for what seemed hours, but only took a few minutes. A chill filled the air, then the shadows vanished. They looked at each other. Then they looked at their creation. As the shadows vanished, Hans heard voices echoing in the distance. Look, and you will see. Search, and you will find. The answers of the black heaven. Voltarian looked at the creation. He was an astronomer. Something looked familiar. The patterns of the rocks resembling something. Scanning the patterns of the various sized rocks, Hans's collage looked similar to the star constellation of the Big Dipper. He looked closer. Clearly visible were the seven stars making up the constellation. The other colleagues showed the constellation of Aquarius, Aris Cans Major. Clearly, the other zodiac constellations were visible. What was puzzling, one rock seemingly out of place, a larger stone, an unknown planet. This made Voltarian think. Reports, articles, rumors. The planet X occurred to him. Articles of astrological, electromagnetic topics ran through his mind, along with experiments of cymatics. Different kinds and waves of energy occurred to him. Something bothered him. Something he had not noticed. Something somewhere was out of place. Voltarian and old lady Schroeder started talking about the ancient Indian legends. Old man Schroeder mentioned the ridge with ancient meaning on his property. Hans gave Schroeder a questioning look. Where is this ridge? Can I see it? Old man pointed over the hill. Follow me. The two men walked in silence among the hidden hills for what seemed several hours, but it was only a few minutes. Hans looked behind him. He had an uneasy feeling. All he saw was trees, brush. The house he used for his bearing was no longer visible. It would be easy to become lost. Hans stopped, not knowing where he was. Nervously, he took a deep breath, listened to the sounds of the American forest, the strange bird calls, the distant popping of tree limbs. Everything seemed different than Hans's remembrance of his country's forest. The fresh, humid air, pungent aroma of the trees, decaying leaves filled his senses. Hans looked into the weathered face, small, sparkling black eyes, eyes of experience and warning. The old man pointed to footprint of his shoe. Hans looked at his leather shoe and the soft, decaying foliage. Speaking softly, using few words, spoke a deliberate warning. I is a hunter, tracker. This is the wild forest. Anything is possible. Sometimes the hunter becomes the hunted. Always hide your tracks. Never leave a trail for the hate to follow. Hans understood. He was in a compromised situation where he did not have the upper hand. He did not like the feeling of vulnerability, but wanted to see where they were talking about. He stopped walking side by side and followed the old man's lead, but still wondering what this hate thing was all about. Reaching the top of a ridge, a valley appeared before him. On the opposite side of the valley stood a 25-foot High rock wall, the late afternoon sunlight showed mysteriously on the limestone wall. The afternoon light revealed a crystalline image, an unmistakable sparkling outline of a Hebrew letter. The image was not carved into the limestone. The image was formed into the limestone like a natural image formed from the molten rock. Hans remembered the letter, Dyad. It meant a gate, a door. He stepped to the right. The sunlight revealed another letter. Zalen, weapon, shining sword, brightness, light. The images, the method, the message showed intention, showed methodology, all pieces to a much larger puzzle. Is this a message of instruction or a message of warning? 
The wall looked like it had once continued longer, revealing more information. Yet it was since been destroyed, hiding the messages forever. Hans wondered who had created it and who destroyed it. Why leave part of the message intact? Standing in silence, Hans' mind went to his store, thinking about the ancient medallions in his collection, a medallion which puzzled him. It was called Solomon's Seal. The twelve Hebrew letters on the outer circle and another twelve Hebrew letters on the inner circle. Yet he never gave the seal much thought. Yet his grandfather made him promise to never sell it. Now he wondered if there was a secret meaning to all this. Old man Schroeder mumbled, getting dark, need to get back. Strange things happen here at night. The hate be out soon. Hans gave him a quizzical look and nodded in agreement.